fellows, thank you so much for participating in this today. Um, you guys come here every day and work on making our country better. Um, today we're going to do that in a little bit of a different way with a special guest who has been doing that for many years in the most innovative, interesting, adventurous, and sometimes risky ways. Um, a real hero of mine and i um, really excited about what we're going to talk about today. To introduce Carl Malamud, um, Joel Morante is going to talk a little bit. Hey guys, well as you know I'm a resident legal fellow here, uh, so when I was asked to introduce Carl here I was both honored and privileged uh, at the task because I've uh, followed his work for a long time uh, throughout school, um, both opening up the database of patent records or the SEC or just the law in general, which we're all presumed to know. Uh, so it would be nice if we had access to it or could actually read it. Uh, so professionals, students, or anyone else, uh, we're citizens uh, and this is our law. Uh, so here to tell you about that and why it's just so important uh, that we're here, the work that we're doing, uh, and why you should be involved and pay a lot more attention to these issues. Uh, I introduce to you our unofficial chief open archivist of the United States, Mr. <laughs> Carl Malamud. Well, thank you very much. I I'm really happy to be here at Code for America. This is one of the organizations that really is making a huge difference in open government. And I, I think Jen and all the fellows really need to be congratulated for, for doing this because uh, it's, it's making real results. Um, I want to talk today about the law. I mean, when, you, when you think about the law, you think about court opinions, you, know, you think about Congress passing laws, but the most important laws are actually the regulations of the executive branch. Most people don't read Supreme Court opinions, but if you're a dry cleaner, you need to know what toxic chemicals are prohibited, and if you're a worker in a factory, you know, need to know about workplace safety. Um, there's 170,000 pages of federal executive branch law on something called the Code of Federal Reg uh, Regulations. The Federal Register is our official newspaper of the government. It's a daily newspaper. It's called the Official Gazette of, of our federal government. It actually came about during the New Deal when there were a whole bunch of new regulations passed and the government, FDR's government, brought a company called the uh, Panama Refining Company to court. Um, what was known as the hot oil case and said you're, you're not obeying the law and it got all the way to the Supreme Court and it turns out they had never published those regulations. They had forgotten to publish them and there's no way Panama oil could have known about those regulations and Justice Brandeis said you know this isn't going to scale because obviously FDR was really like making much more government and so he called up his buddy Felix Frankfurter at Harvard who was still a professor. He hadn't been named to the court and Frankfurter brought in a guy named Erwin um, Griswold, who was a young <laughs> professor, went on to be the dean of Harvard Law School, and they came up with this idea of the Federal Register, of an official gazette of the United States government. It's a concept that actually goes all the way back to the Roman Republic. And in 1936, the Office of the Federal Register was formed, and the Federal Register is a notice of all proposed regulations. It's a notice of all enacted regulations. The Code of Federal Regulations says, takes all the regulations currently in force and it puts them into different sections. So all the regulations having to do with hazardous materials transport or workplace safety. There's another concept that you need to know about and it's called incorporation by reference. And this was a space saving measure. It said, well, you know, we want to do a regulation, but we want to refer to some document that's going to have the force of law, but we don't want to like copy the document. For some documents, you don't want to copy them because it's already out there, like the Code of Federal Regulations itself or the U.S. Constitution. And you don't want to copy it and maybe make a mistake. That doesn't make any sense at all. And so this method of we, we propose a regulation and we hereby incorporate by reference, as if it were here, this external document. It requires the regulator to say, I want to incorporate this document. It requires the director of the office of the Federal Register to approve the incorporation by reference. And there's about 3,000 of those documents that have been incorporated by reference. There's also a requirement that says, well, if you're going to incorporate something by reference from the private sector, it has to have been developed using an open process. If we're going to delegate the lawmaking authority to someone else, we want to make sure that consumers are heard from and that it isn't kind of a closed backroom thing. 
Now you may ask, what kind of standards are we talking about? What kind of documents are incorporated by reference? The vast majority are technical documents that are public safety standards, workplace standards, and I brought you a few samples to look at. Um, so I'm going to hand these out here. Yes, yeah, sure. So you go ahead and open these things up. There we go. Now these are all standards that have been incorporated into the Code of Federal Regulations. I'll do these. And these are documents that I've purchased at, at uh, a great cost, tens of thousands of dollars. These are posters, by the way, from the National Bureau of Standards in the 1930s. And so why don't you go ahead and hand these out. Um, be a little bit careful with these. Some of them come in a shrink wrap license that says by opening this, this standard, which is mandated by law, I hereby agree not to copy it, not to do anything with it, um, which is a little bit silly. And then I got more of this stuff. You might be interested, by the way, in the um, income tax returns of some of the standards bodies that are out there. They're kind of interesting to read. And then we got a couple more things here. And I'm going to explain what these big bundles are and what we did with them. Somebody should want the International Property Maintenance Code. Absolutely. And by the way, some of those are shrink wrap. So I have here a magnetic end user license agreement that you can put on your refrigerator. And it says by somehow penetrating this magnetic barrier, I agree that no one can take away my right to read the law. Uh, <laughs> so here's more bundles. Go ahead and open these things up if you want. And I'll explain what this is all about as we go along. Okay, so what are these standards? Uh, these things really are by far the most important laws that regulate our daily life. OSHA has workplace standards, so the standard for safety of metal ladders, the standard for safety of wood ladders, the standard for safety of cranes, and as you know, cranes tend to tip over if they're not installed properly. So that's a big issue. The Federal uh, Food and Drug Administration, the Consumer Safety Product Association, have all sorts of standards for the safety of baby strollers, for example, so they don't chop off your fingers, as McLaren strollers did for a while. National Archives and Records Administration uh, incorporates by reference standards for saving film and making sure that the film doesn't blow up when it's getting stored. Uh, housing and Urban Development has standards for building safety. Mine sa uh, Safety and Health Administration has standards standards for mine safety. Now the idea is that you really want these standards to be developed by, by the private industry, by a consensus-based process. And so you don't just want the government doing this by fiat. You want the experts. You want the National Fire and Protection Association to be doing the fire standards. These things are kind of pricey. If you buy a standards from underwriters labs, and there's many of them incorporated at the federal level, they cost $850 each. The National Sanitation Foundation standard for water hygiene is $500. The two to three page standards for things like how to test for lead in water, $64 each. And so if you want to just kind of graze and browse through this stuff to see what's in there, it's a lot of money. And because it costs so much money, you don't find this stuff in libraries because they can't afford to buy it. This is big business. Underwriters Laboratories, $873 million a year revenue stream. National Fire Protection Association, $50 million a year revenue stream. These are big salaries as well. Every one of these organizations that makes the standards is a 501c3 nonprofit. But look at the CEO compensation. The head of Underwriters Laboratories, $2.2 million a year in compensation. It is the highest nonprofit salary I've found, with the exception of the director of the New York Philharmonic, who I think actually probably deserves his $2.6 million. Uh, but this is higher than any university president. The head of American National Standards Institute, $1 million a year. Um, in fact, I took nine of the leading nonprofits that are out there um, and looked at their CEO compensation, and I threw in one more nonprofit that makes standards, and it's United States of America. And it turns out the USA CEO, Barack Obama, has the lowest salary out of all, all of these nonprofit organizations. So 
it's important that these guys get money to make standards, but I'm not necessarily convinced they need quite as much as they need. And not only that, they are nonprofits and they have an obligation to serve the public. So it's important to have high quality standards, right? You want the fire chiefs helping to work on fire protection standards. You don't want the government necessarily spending a whole bunch of money to develop things. On the other hand, there's another consideration. And that consideration is the right to read the law. Going back to 1824, the Supreme Court said there is no copyright in the law. And the reason for that is because the government doesn't own the law. The people do. The people are sovereign, and they have delegated lawmaking authority to the states and to the federal government. And that's the grand compromise of our Constitutional Convention, was that the people are sovereign, not the government. There was a case in 2002 by a guy named Peter Veck, who was a webmaster in Savoy, Texas. And Peter thought to himself, I want to put the Texas building code online. Now, Texas had incorporated by reference one of the model building codes and then had a legislation that says, we hereby incorporate by reference the following code. And he took that and he put it online and he got sued by the code people. And it went all the way up to the Fifth Circuit of the Court of Appeals. And they ruled that there is no copyright on the law after it's been promulgated. There might have been copyright on the model code that was developed. But you know that model code was intended to be the law. In fact, it had a sample um, ordinance at the beginning of it. Many of these things do that, that say, we the people of, insert name of jurisdiction here, do hereby ad adopt the following as the law of the land. So this really is a constitutional issue. John Adams said, we are an empire of laws, not a nation of men. And what he meant by that is, we don't get together in a back room and kind of decide it on the fly. We write the law down. The law is what rules our country, not individual people. This is an issue of equal um, protection under the law, of, of due process under the law. You know that a poll tax is illegal because you can't have your constitutional right to vote depending on your ability to pay a poll tax. To me, when you charge for these standards, that's a poll tax on access to justice. To me, at least, the right to bear knowledge of this sort shouldn't be a concealed carry privilege. This is way more important than the Second Amendment when you think about it. This is kind of a fundamental constitutional issue. So how do you change this situation in which you got a billion dollar a year industry that's kind of marked out the right to, to sell portions of the law? We think this isn't right based on the VEC decision, but at the federal level, this has never been litigated. And if you go to Washington and say, I want to publish all the standards incorporated by reference, they look at you and say, no, 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 you can't do that. VEC decision was very specific, only applies to the Texas Building Code. So how do you handle that? Well, we went out and bought 73 of the standards incorporated by reference at the federal level with a focus on public safety, crane safety, worker safety, um, uh, foot protective safety, things of that sort. Spent $7,414 on these 73 standards, and many of them come shrink-wrapped. And we made 25 copies. Now, you know, you talk to the standards people, they say, no, 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 you can't make any copies. In fact, often if you buy a PDF document, it comes with DRM. Um, some of these guys won't even let you print your PDF file, and you can't, like, move it to another computer. It's actually tied to your computer, so you don't even have the right to sell the document that you purchased. But we went ahead and made 25 print copies. That way there's none of this issue about the internet and infinite copies and oh my god, the cat's out of the bag. 25 carefully controlled copies. 10 sets of these went to the standards bodies with these certificates of incorporation that you see on the front of these documents saying this is compulsory under the United States of America, there's criminal penalties. And we included a notice of incorporation. These have been incorporated by the Office of the Federal Register. Here is your copy. Comments must be received by May 1, 2012. Now, I have no way to obligate them to comment, but we went ahead and sent it anyway. We also made seven sets and sent them to government officials. They went to the Chairman of the Federal Trade Commission. They went to the Office of the Federal Register. They went to uh, Chairman Issa in the House of Representatives. They went to Cass Sunstein in the White House again asking them to comment on this procedure. We didn't get any comments back from anybody. 
In fact, a couple groups just sent them back, returned to sender. We don't want this big pile, 29 pile, 29 pound pile of standards. So what we're doing now, haven't received any comments, we're beginning the process of publishing. The initial 73 standards we've retyped into HTML, all the tables have been nicely typeset, the graphics are being redone as SVG graphics. Um, we have a, uh, we're using PDF um, prints, prints XML to take the HTML and turn it back into PDF files with the pagination correct, so we now have basically retypeset these things. We have purchased another probably three or four hundred of these standards. In addition, we found a whole bunch of government promulgated standards, you know, mill specs and EPA standards that are, many of them are not available. They're, they're available on a used market or there's a guy at everyspec.com that seems to have collected a lot of the military specs. So we're kind of gathering those and we're beginning the process of, of publishing those documents. Uh, we're beginning to work at the state level. There's about a million pages of state regulations that incorporate, in addition, things by reference. If you look at countries like India, they have a right to information law that is founded in their constitution. We think that might cover this situation. If you look at South Africa, they have a promotion of the right to information to act, which we think means that maybe their building codes can be published. And so we're beginning to look at countries like that to see whether this same publication of the law is, is a possibility. Uh, to me, this is partly about the ability to read the law, but I think this is also about innovation, right? This is about some small business person deciding, you know, I've got a better idea for a car alarm. I wonder if I can, like, start a business. But today, in order to do that, you have to go buy dozens of $65 standards from the Society of Automotive Engineers. And you can't even really like flesh out your idea to see whether or not you want to do it. And I'll grant you that once you're General Motors, you can afford 65 bucks. But if you're sitting at home and you just have an idea. So to me, this is kind of a tax on, on small business innovation. Even more important, it's a tax on education. If we're serious about STEM, about scientific, technical, engineering, and mathematics education, which is one of President Obama's signature efforts, it seems to me that the state of the art, as codified in all these standards, ought to be available to our students to read. So this is about innovation, uh, but it's also simply about the right to make a democracy work. Uh, John Adams, again, talked about the only way to make a democracy work is to have an informed citizenry. That, that you couldn't have a democracy unless the citizenry were informed. And he actually said, let every sluice of knowledge be set aflowing, uh, which I thought was a very stirring way to, 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 to put this. And this wasn't a information must be free. It's that for our government to work, our citizens need to understand what's going on. To me, the the laws really are the operating system of our society and to me the code of federal regulations is the manual. When I go to Washington and say this is really an important issue, I say oh come on you're making a lot of to do about nothing. People aren't going to want to read this stuff. Um, it's too technical. It's what I call the dumb American theory that, that the only people that are going to care about this are a few industry honchos and maybe a couple regulators. But I disagree with that, and, and my answer to them is just show me the manual. I can read this stuff, um, and I think there's a lot of Americans that can. And so we're here today. We've been talking all week to building officials and fire marshals and automotive experts, and the question for you folks is, is this stuff relevant? Does it, you know, does it matter? Um, do we want to read these documents? And so we're here today to kind of see what you have to say. Like I said, I brought samples. Um, and to really discuss this issue and, and see whether it's something that matters outside of the Washington Beltway. So that, that's kind of my prepared spiel and I'm hoping at this point we can just begin you know, talking and discussing the issues. There, there's a lot of complications, right? I mean we want the standards bodies to make some money because they do, they do good work. Um, on the other hand, the law has to be available. This is not a cut and dried easy issue. So let's have so, that conversation, but I think first we have to give you a round of applause for this amazing, bold, genius initiative. Thank you. It's so cool what you are doing here. So, uh, Carl, I want to just ask a couple of uh, clarifying questions for us. You, you used the term we several times. Sometimes you're referring to we, the, you know, the public. We the people. We the people. Uh, other times, though, you're uh, referring to we, your organization that's doing this. That's... Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so I, I, I uh, run public.resource.org. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, just like Code for America. We are five years old. Uh, we are one staff member, which is me. Um, on the other hand, we work very closely with a whole bunch of, of very talented contractors. Our hosting is done by the Internet Systems Consortium run by Paul Vixie. Uh, my sysadmin happens to be the chief information officer at Netflix. That's his day job. He's pretty good, um, to say the <laughs> least. Um, so we is, is public.resource.org, but I get a lot of help. So for example, we sublet office space from O'Reilly Media, and that means for uh, a real pittance of rent, um, we get not only really nice space next to Maker Labs and, and an amazing video operation, but you know there's a warehouse and a reception desk and, and all sorts of services. So a lot of a lot of leverage. A little more than more than I was asking. I always will give you more than you want. Uh, <laughs> I, I just wanted to have a sort of quick reaction uh, based a little bit on uh, two of these standards that ended up uh, in front of me. Uh, one of them, uh, you know, sort of is a standard uh, called Drinking Water System Components Health Effects. And I want to uh, highlight that one because of a business that I tried to start 30-some years ago. Back in the early days when O'Reilly uh, and Associates was a, uh, a documentation consulting company rather than a publishing company. We hadn't yet become a publisher. We were thinking about businesses we could be in. And I went out and got a water test, and I couldn't make head or tail out of the results. And I thought, oh, let's get into a business uh, where you, when people get a water test, they get a document explaining exactly what it means and how to interpret it. And I could have used this back then, <laughs> you know, because it would have helped me to understand, you know, what was involved in uh, water coming to you. So I, I think it, it seems sort of far-fetched that entrepreneurs would care about this stuff. Uh, but it is interesting. You know, in those days, of course, uh, it would have been hard to get even if it didn't cost, as it turns out, $570 uh, because we didn't have the Internet uh, yet. But, you know, when we have this rich resource of, uh, of online content, it does seem that your notion that, oh, my gosh, this actually has the force of law and we can't read it without paying for it uh, is a pretty important uh, concept. Not only that, you can't quote it. And so if you wanted to start a business explaining the law to people about water testing, for example, in theory, you couldn't quote this document without a license from the producer. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons we don't want just a crippleware you know, site up there with a, a bad copy of the law available to read. We want to be able to take the law, retype it, redo the graphics, and make it better and more understandable and get folks like O'Reilly Media to, to build value added on top. So the, the, the second comment that I wanted to make was to put this sort of in the context of uh, just open systems in general. I'm, I'm looking, the second one that landed in front of me is called computational pipeline mo monitoring for liquid pipelines. And that's kind of a little more uh, sort of modern. It's kind of pretty interesting, uh, you know, technology. It turns out I had dinner last night with Jeff Immelt, the CEO of GE. And he's talking about that he sees one of the next big challenges is how do we build the industrial internet, you know, which is this is very much uh, in the middle of. And, it, you know, it kind of looks, you know, it made me think of, of the internet standards, you know, coming out of the IETF and how important those were for us starting to, you know, build the technology that all of us take for granted today. And the fact that those were open was why the internet took off, because people could read them could interpret them, could collaborate on them. And, you know, we're now kind of moving from a world in which that, quote, internet-y thing, you know, which was sort of over there on the side in its own world, and yeah, it works this way, and yeah, they've done this funny thing with openness, uh, you know, is starting to merge with this old world of industry. You know, so part of the discussion last night was, you know, how do we open up information about you know, our jet engines? How do we open up information about our pipeline monitoring? How do we open up information about our, our medical diagnostic devices in such a way that we can build a developer culture? So that was a really interesting, you know, it's an interesting um, conjunction because, you know, it's easy to see this stuff as old school and not relating to what we do on the internet. And yet I think that we're headed for a collision course where we are, in fact, wanting to actually bring the internet into all those old worlds, and we're going to actually need to have access to all this stuff because 
In fact, we're going to be making uh, smart devices that are, you know, are connected to the internet. So that, that's uh, uh, kind of an interesting uh, dimension. I also want to talk really briefly about the notion of openness and just how powerful it is economically. You know, I've used as my uh, sort of touchstone for this uh, the World Wide Web, certainly open source software to a lesser extent. But, you know, we're living in a world uh, that was created by Tim Berners-Lee putting the web into the public domain. But I was recently struck uh, by something I hadn't really quite thought about uh, before. Uh, George Dyson recently uh, wrote a book about the early history of computing. And it uh, turns out that you know, when John von Neumann kind of and, and his crew developed sort of the fundamental ideas of digital computing, there was an intense discussion about whether that should be patented. And he lobbied very hard and won. And they actually put that into the public domain. And so our entire infrastructure of computing that we know today was based on the notion that this stuff is so important that anybody should be able to read it, that anybody should be able to have access to it. And I think you know, part of what you know, Code for America is trying to do is to, to bridge gaps between a world that does not work like the internet and this new world that we're building uh, on the internet. And I think, Carl, you've hit on a really interesting place where uh, this is not happening and needs to happen. Let, let me tell a brief story, and then we're going to open this up, which is, you know, there were two internets in the early days. There was one called Open Systems Interconnection, which was based on closed standards, very expensive standards. And there was the internet that we know of, and there was a, the, a protocol called TCP IP, Transport Control Protocol, Internet Protocol. When Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn came up with TCP IP, I don't know if you know this, but it didn't work. But the specs were out there, and a guy named Van Jacobson at Berkeley came up with a 12-line patch, and all of a sudden it worked. OSI never worked. And it was because it didn't get that random effect of people reading the specs and saying, wait a minute, I can make this better. And so to me, this is why you want to make it available to, to students and to small business people, because they're going to make our society better. It'll be safer. It'll work better. If you can read the standard for safety in metal ladders and look at it and say, you know, I can make a safer ladder, that's important. So does anybody have any comments here about this? Uh, standards in front of you, questions, diatribes, flames, right over here. Um, it looks like on the back of the ones you've incorporated that you've got the 990 from, uh, from ANSI here. And I think the executive compensation argument is, is pretty interesting. Have you done studies to see how much of the revenue that these organizations make is from publishing as opposed to other activities? Uh, it depends on the organization. So Underwriters Labs is a really big operation and in, in a pretty small part of their revenue. National Fire Protection Association, I believe about 40% of, of their revenue is National Electrical Code, which is incorporated by reference all over the country. So it's a very important revenue stream for, for those folks. Um, but they all have other ways of making money. And I think one of the things we have to look at is, is maybe their business models need to adjust. But you know what? We've all had to adjust our business models. If you look at the financial industry, if you look at the medical industry, the legal industry, and that includes these SDOs, Standards Development Organizations, is one of the few last bastions of you know, pay-per-view, uh, you know, closed standards, closed law. And I think it's time to, to look at the reality of the internet and maybe adjust that a little bit. Over here. Um, why don't you play a bit of a devil's advocate and say, I don't want these 200 pounds of code to be available to me on the internet because even if I had access to them, they don't make any sense to consumers. Um, so just for example, here's a section on demolition. The code official shall order the owner of any premises upon which is located any structure which in the code official judgment after review is so deteriorated or dilapidated or has become so out of repair as to be dangerous unsafe, insanitary, otherwise unfit for human habitation or occupancy, and such that it is unreasonable to repair the structure, to demolish and remove such structure, or if such structure is incapable of being made safe by repairs to repair oh, and make me. safe and safe. <laughs> um, what it's saying is if your structure is in bad shape because it's dangerous or unsanitary, or you've been stalling on construction for more than two years, you're in trouble. You have to either board it up or demolish this building. So. 
that translation, I think, is what would be useful to citizens and not the text of this code. Well, and, but if the standard's not available, somebody like you can't make that translation. I think when we talk about taking the internet to um, our governance and our standards, it's not just the code of the internet, but also maybe some of the guiding principles. Um, Groupon's a, a startup that has um, a very opinionated um, copywriting voice. They've published a guide that's publicly available. And um, their guide helps them shape their content so that it's really usable to their consumers. Um, in that case, it's the group, Groupon consumers. but. It seems like something incredibly, you know, almost as valuable as as, uh, as putting this on the internet is applying maybe some of those principles to this code so that people know what the hell it's trying to get us to do. Sure, it's the same argument. It's the same argument that we make about putting raw data on the internet. Um, like the, the federal government has how many data sets available right now? Um, I mean, just even just looking at census data, there's so much data, and it's completely incomprehensible to most of us. Um, just because of the way it's organized, nothing's explained. Um, there are tables that have column names that are literally like strings of letters and numbers, like monkeys typing on a keyboard. Nobody has any idea what this means. And so I, I, I agree that, that you're right. Putting the specifications for aluminum structures as written online is not going to be immediately valuable. But I think the value comes after that when it's online and somebody looks at it and starts to explain it and starts to issue, uh, you know, saying like this section of it is saying this. Um, and that's when people can start to actually get some meaning out of it. But why not leapfrog that while we're putting this incredible effort into putting this all online? But it's not just, just as a rhetorical question. It's not just there. putting it online though, it's opening up the licensing, right? Isn't that the, the main argument is, is the legal battle to, to make it so that you can actually publish this at all. So to me the issue is if you think there's too much regulation or not enough regulation or if you think particular regulations are poorly written, today you really have no way of reading those documents and by making them available right now if you want to like modify that particular standard there you've got to travel to wherever that standards meeting is to make your your point that you know I can't understand what the hell you're saying we should write this in plain English and so I think the foundational issue is by making the law available you can let publishers try to figure out how to how to make sense of what's there but you can also allow consumers if all proposed regulations Regulations are published in the, in the Federal Register, including the technical standards, which today are not. Um, you could read it. You could read the Federal Register. You could look at the documents that are proposed to be a regulation, and you could submit that comment. But today, the only way to examine the text of the standard being proposed to be the law is to go buy a copy. You know, there's another uh, interesting point, which is that if uh, even if you don't say, oh, yeah, this is really useful for me to read it, if it's secret and you don't have access to it, somebody can say to you, oh, that's against the rules. And all you can say is, OK. But if you can read it, you can say, wait a minute, no, it isn't. And we had that uh, discussion with, uh, what's? Uh, with uh, uh, Forrest Frizzell in Honolulu. Uh, no, his, his boss. Um, Gordon Bruce. Yeah, Gordon Bruce, uh, who's the IT director in yeah. Honolulu. Uh, when he came in from the private sector, he was told, he said, he was yeah. told all the time, oh, you, you can't do that, it's against the law. And his response was, show me the law. And then they say, well, it wasn't really a law, it was a regulation. He said, well, show me the regulation then. And then it would be, well, actually, it uh, turns out it was a policy that, you know, some predecessor had issued. And he says, well, I can change that, you know, but if somebody can just say, sorry, you know, it's the law, and you don't really have access to that law, uh, it makes it very, very hard to question the assumptions. It makes it hard to change. And I think that's, at least in my understanding, that's part of what uh, you're trying to change, is that culture that we can incorporate something by reference is written in opaque language. That's bad enough. But not only that, you actually have to pay to find out what's in it. And so you can't argue. And, you know, and I think, uh, you know, the notion that this is, this is a government of laws, not of people, really depends on our ability to, to actually, if we have to, to go see that.
question. On There's the, also, okay. if I can just add, uh, I heard a radio program this weekend about the 2010 Plain Language Act, which is very poorly uh, complied with, obviously. Uh, but this is actually was passed into law in 2010 that, that, that laws need to be written in, in language that's understandable. Um, and I've just been inspired by the work that um, the Santa Cruz team has been doing um, with the business permitting process in Santa Cruz at, uh, can I say the URL, opencounter.org? Um, that takes a different process um, that's, in, that's extremely complex and has been frustrating citizens and, and explains it in language that you, know, you, I, and everyone else can understand. And um, I think this work enables more of that kind of work. So the goal would be uh, anybody can read the law, but nobody needs to because we've actually built better interfaces to it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. There was a comment over here and then over there next. So. Yeah, I was just curious if you could eliminate the strategy a little bit more. I think I can glean from what you're saying what it is, but it sounds like there's an attempt for you to be like the guy in Texas in 2002, so you're sort of pushing some buttons here. And is the, the goal to, to get into litigation so that you break down those, those I don't barriers? want to be sued. Um, we started posting all the building codes of the country in 2007 based on the VEC decision. We've taken the California Title 24 and totally redone it. HTML, MathML, SVG graphics. No nasty letters, no lawsuits. It is our hope that we put people on notice. We did a very elaborate print production to say, hey, we're serious about this. This isn't a whim. This isn't an information must be free kind of hack. This is we've, we've done our legal research. We think we have a right. Leave us alone. Develop standards. We're going to publish the law. And so our hope is not to get sued. Because if we get sued, we're going to be tied up in court for a few years. Yeah. We'd much rather just publish the expanded version of the Code of Federal Regulations. Along the same lines, um, in terms of the strategy, so a lot of the standards are written by private companies, right? And then you have to actually go purchase, uh, pay them a bunch of money so as to be able to get some printed copies of these things. Um, what's the, so, you know, that's, eventually that's not scalable because you're paying, you know, out of a finite lump sum of money. What's the, uh, what's the hope or what's the goal? How, how does the systemic change occur? So we have uh, made two points in our letters to the various government officials. Point one is stuff that's already been incorporated by reference into law needs to be available. That's a constitutional issue. Point two is that government has shirked its responsibility. They said that, gee, we're going to incorporate by reference. Therefore, it's not going to cost the government money. The SDOs make money. Everything's great. Um, and the theory is the government isn't expending revenues. Now, that's false, actually. We saw the, the um, building inspector for Sonoma County, and he's got a $30,000 a year line item for his building inspectors to buy codes every year. Every single county, every city, all the federal officials. I've talked to small business administration officials that incorporate by reference documents. And what happens is they have to buy these documents, too, and they only buy one and it's in the shelf in the other building. And so the people that have to enforce the law don't have access to the documents. I know a member of Congress during the BP oil spill wanted to read the hazmat standards. And they called API, the American Petroleum Institute, in, and they said, no, I want to read a copy of this document. And they looked at this member of Congress in the eye and said, well, that's a $1,500 document. You'll have to buy it. Member of Congress. That's just outrageous. That really is. Do you guys see a parallel to um, any of the work that you've done in, in terms of um, the reactions that your partners in City Hall would have to this kind of uh, um, new approach and how you might, you know, how you might talk to them about that or, or convey your, your position on it? Well, I think there's good parallels with open data and open standards. Um, a few years ago when most government websites would publish forms as Microsoft Word documents as opposed to something in an open standard, I know that was a, a a fight that was being fought. Now I think we're doing a similar thing with open data. Don't just publish an HTML web page. Go ahead and publish it in a machine-readable format that we can access. So I, I see those as two parallels to, you know, to make that argument to the city government. Anyone else want to come here? Fisher, over here. Well, and just to add on to that, like there are even some counties and, and cities that want to sell you the data back to you that they collected by use of public funds. So uh, there are parallels in that as well. And, and by the way, a little copyright primer here. So the federal government's not allowed to own copyright, 
Um, that's just a policy that we've had. They, they can, uh, if you donate like Walt Disney to the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian can continue to assert copyright over that, but the government officials cannot. States are allowed to own copyright. On the other hand, uh, there's a whole set of, of, of constitutional Supreme Court decisions that say the law is a special sacred area and there is no copyright in the law at any level of government. Hence, the Texas Building Code has no copyright. So a video produced by a city conceivably could have copyright. I think that's bad public policy, frankly. Um, or if they have copyright, it ought to be a, a very open license. But the law itself, and that's the argument we're making here, has no copyright. And I think that's a fundamental part of our democracy. We've been talking about access a lot. And access in terms of, you know, do we have to pay to see something or is it free? I think that the question of access is actually broader than that. Um, a few weeks ago, I was uh, trying and have not succeeded so far in uh, completing this research project where I'm trying to find out how many of the municipalities within California have as part of their city code um, a uh, requirement that bicycles be licensed within city limits. There are, I think, 490 some odd cities, uh, municipalities, that is to say, cities and towns in California. And there are, I think, I found six different code publishers. These are private companies, um, some of whom have no search interface, uh, some of whom have a search interface, but it doesn't work especially well. And then there are some municipalities that don't have their code online at all. So the point is that as a research project, even though I guess technically I have access to all of these codes, they're freely available, I don't have to pay for it. In terms of actually getting the information that I want, it's, I mean, it's not feasible. You know, 50% so, of municipalities in California assert copyright over their municipal codes. And I think that's one of the, the, the reasons for reuse. It's why we don't just want a, um, a, a site online that, that some code company did. Because, for example, what I want to do is bring all the municipal codes in and, and put it up so you can say, how are the parking regulations different in the cities in Sonoma County? Uh, how does zoning change? What are the building code exceptions in Santa Rosa versus Sebastopol? If you're a contractor, you really care about that stuff. And that's why the law has to have no copyright, so that you can look at it and say, you know, I can make a better interface, and therefore the citizenry will be better informed, and maybe you can make money. I have no, no reason you know, to say, gee, you shouldn't start a business making money off the law. You just shouldn't have an exclusive over it, that's all. Well, you know, there's an interesting point that comes up out of uh, uh, what you're saying here. I'm thinking about um, the role of standardization in making government more effective and in mm -hmm. this whole notion that I put out about government as a platform. You know, we talk about GTFS, for example, uh, coming out of TriMet in Portland where they said, okay, we're going to publish our um, you know, transit data in this format. Let's work with outside technology partners who will then read that format and they can deliver apps. That's why we have transit information in, in, in Google. And we also have all kinds of iPhone apps. Other cities were able to adopt the same format because it was published, because it was made available. And what I was thinking about in the case of your bicycle codes, how many of these codes are, because they're private, they're actually being redone at the municipal level again and again and again, differently, incompatibly. And this came up recently when I, uh, in a conversation with Joel Mahoney, uh, who was a fellow last year, about the Discover BPS program. Because you know, one of the, the issues in Discover BPS, it's a great application for kids finding uh, you know, how to get to the nearest school, what schools they're eligible for, or for parents to find that out. Uh, you know, the notion, well, it's hard to roll out to other municipalities because they have different rules about school eligibility. And that leads you down the path of thinking, wow, are those different rules a good thing? Or would we be better if we followed the path of something like GTFS and somebody said, well, we're going to publish the rules. We've thought about them. We're going to make them available in such a way that other people can use them. And some good set of rules will propagate. We have less time, money, and effort in people re, you know, reinventing the wheel. Uh, we have the ability of th outside third parties to build applications and services that work 
transparently across a set of standards. And, and so you start thinking about the work that we do, things, areas like you know, 311 systems or uh, you know, the, the business permitting uh, work that's going on in Santa Cruz. There's a standardization of data formats that's the back end of that that will make all those applications more portable. And it seems to me that you know, there's hidden in this big pile of standards are probably a lot of opportunities for uh, standardization at the technical level that would allow apps that worked across jurisdictions. Absolutely. And uh, you know, I think that's an area really worth thinking about. Absolutely. More comments? Right over here? Um, I'm wondering, we're talking about like how confusing a lot of this is, how hard it is to get to some of this information. I feel like beyond that is even the fact that it's confusing to know, like, is it, is it anywhere, is it accessible to find out what is public? Like, if you just get to the very bottom of it, like, how can a citizen find out what is publicly, uh, like, what is their right to see? What can they have a right to be charged for, right? So, like, okay, all law that's passed is public domain. Like, we found out in Georgia that the city, the state of Georgia gives the city the right to recoup their costs for buying Esri software. So therefore they can charge you for the data that they collect from your tax dollars. So therefore the law says that this is not like free and available to you. Like is there a clear explanation that people can get to of like what they even have the right to today? No, and, and public resource has spent the last five years trying to get this principle that if it's a law it must be available. Um, I think it's bad public policy to charge for mapping data. Um, it depends on the, the states and the municipalities whether that's legal or not. I think it's silly. Um, but the law is something that really has to be available and there needs to be a bright, clear line in which every citizen says if it's a law, I ought to be able to get it. There's another issue. I've been going through the Code of Federal Regulations looking for all these, these mandated standards from government. Uh, many are done by government. Many are private. A lot of these are simply unavailable. They're just not out there. Um, sometimes I can find them on eBay. Sometimes I can call up the association and they'll, they'll charge me a $100 research fee and send me a really bad scan of an old document which happens to still be on the books. I called up the National Institute of Standards and Technology which has a registry of all standards incorporated by reference. Said, you know, you got a lot of mistakes in here. Have you done an audit yet on this registry? It's like, oh, well, you know, well, that's a good point. Thanks for bringing it up. But you'd think the government would know which standards they've incorporated by reference. I actually suggested to the Office of the Federal Register that they amend their markup for the Federal Register so that when something is incorporated by reference, there's a tag around that standard that says SIBR, standard incorporated by reference, or PSIBR, proposed standard to be incorporated by reference. And that way we know. Well, I think that's brings up another point, which is as much as we can sit here and say, we believe this should be public, it should be easy to get to, like, you can also get to the point where it's like, okay, well, the cities, like, can't actually do this, and we still end up in a standstill, which, like, I'm sure, like, many of our cities are experiencing, like, we're in a standstill with our city because, one, the city has no idea if this information we want is actually theirs to give away, who it belongs to, right? So that was my first point. The second point is they actually don't have the technical capacity to do this. And so a lot of what we're talking about, too, will hit that roadblock of like, yeah, we want them to add tags and markup, and we want them to put it online, and we want every city to put their bicycle law online. But like the cities don't have the capacity to do this, which is why Code for America exists. <laughs> that's why you guys <laughs> but, are so important. But no. that, that's exactly saying, like, why you're so that's important. That's a huge sort of thing to not ignore in all of this, too, is like, how do we change the structure of government so that government actually has the like, self-sufficiency to do these things? What we do at Public Resources, we look for low-hanging fruit that we can do. So we'll find a database that ought to be available, and sometimes you've got to pay for it, and sometimes you've got to like, go get a whole bunch of DVDs and copy them off. I mean, I took 5,000 DVDs from the Congress and just sat there and copied the things. Um, and then you put it online and you can go to the policy officials and say, you know, this stuff ought to be available. And they say, well, my tech people came in and said it'll cost $50 million to do that. I say, well, you know, I got that database up and running. You want a copy? And again, that's why Code for America fellows are so important because you can go in and speak with authority, say, you know what, 
You could do that if you wanted. It's just a matter of will. It's not technically impossible. And maybe it's good public policy. And that's something that mayors understand, right? The bureaucrat might not. Uh, although many bureaucrats are really, really talented public servants. And if you give them a path forward, they'll take it. Um, and that's, again, why you folks are so important, because you can go out into the cities and, and you can tell them why this is something they can do, as opposed to something that they can't do, which is what they hear all the time. Carl, can you just quickly tell the story, for anyone here who doesn't know about it, but putting the Edgar database online? Oh, yeah. So um, I, I ran the first radio station on the Internet in the early 90s, and you know we, our flagship program was Geek of the Week. It was brought to you by O'Reilly Media. O'Reilly Media, when you think geek, think O'Reilly, um, was actually our tagline. Um, thank you, Tim, for sponsoring and you the that. you the company, um, not the person, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> um, and um, as part of that, we were doing a demo before, before Congressman Markey and his committee, and he had oversight over a bunch of things, including our, our financial system. And he had received a, um, um, uh, a petition from Nader's Raiders saying the SEC Edgar database should be on the internet. And of course the staff was like, so what's the internet? <laughs> and should it be available? And so they brought me in. 1993, right? 1993, and this is actually, yeah, 1993. Um, and so staff brought me in and said, eh, they, they said we should make this stuff on the internet. What do you think? And I looked at the database, and I was a database guy. That's what I did in the 80s. And I said, you know, this is not a big deal. And they brought the SEC in, and obviously when your congressional oversight chairman brings you in, you know, you send in your top tech people, and they said, you know, we'd like to do it, but we have a system. And the system said that the data really isn't ready for Americans, and so we're going to wholesale the data. They had a $30 million deal with me, Data Central, and they'll wholesale the data, and then companies like Disclosure and Bloomberg and others would buy the data, and they'd add value and make it ready for ordinary Americans, and they would sell it. And they were selling public reports of, of corporations for 20 or $30 each. I actually bought a couple. And so I, I went back to the congressional folks and said, you know, this doesn't look like a big deal. And I was able to get a grant from the National Science Foundation. So I took money from the American people, and I used that to buy data from the, the American government to give away to the American people. And it was a little circular. Um, and we got it up and running. Eric Schmidt gave me a computer. He was at Sun in those days. And we had it up and running, and it was FTP at first, and then we had a gopher, which was a big thing. And then that web thing seemed to be taken off, and we did that. And then Brewster Kahle gave us a Waze database, and we had, at the time, one of the larger Waze databases. Turns out we got a little extra money from NSF, so I bought all the patents at the same time. Um, <laughs> we ran that for about a year and a half, and you know, people started using it. Now, what the SEC said, they didn't know what the internet was, and, and we're sitting there in the congressional office, and next to me was Steve Wolf from the National Science Foundation. We look across at the SEC guys, and he goes, you know, this data really just doesn't, really isn't relevant to the internet. I just don't think the internet has the right kind of people. And I couldn't, I couldn't resist. I just looked him in the eye and said, you know, I think the American people are the right kind of people. And Steve kicked me under the table real hard. He's like, behave. Um, so after running this for two years, it turns out it was the right kind of people. We had journalists, and we had students, and we had senior citizen investment clubs. And after two years, we put a little sign up on our website that said, this service will terminate in 60 days. Click here for more information. And you clicked here copy of our source code, we had our user stats, how much it cost us to run it, why we thought it was important, click here to send mail to Al Gore, click here to send mail to Newt Gingrich, the only two people that had an internet address, click here to send mail to the chairman of the SEC. He didn't have email, so we created one for him. 17,000 messages came in from people. We printed those out and ran them down to the SEC, and they happened to have an Edgar Industry Day happening. Uh, we crashed it, made a big stink. Um, at which, which point it got up to the senior levels, right? So the tech people were saying this was impossible. When the commissioners looked at it, they said, well, wait a minute, how much does it cost you to run it? It's like, you know, 500K for us, a million or two for you. It's your government. And they said, okay, well, maybe we should do this. And Chairman Levitt went to the Associated Press and said, we, we will be running the Edgar database. And then I got a call from the chief of staff. Because, you know, so we're going to do this, but you gave us a 60-day deadline. Could you extend that, please? And I was like, no, 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 we, we can't possibly extend it. Um, I said, well, here's the problem. We can't really buy a computer in 60 days. <laughs> and our internet connection is in, but it isn't working. And so Brad Burdick, who worked for me at the time as a sysadmin, we took a couple of Sun computers and threw them in a station wagon, and he drove down there and configured their Cisco router, and I made him sign a loaner agreement for the equipment. We donated all the source code, and they were up and running. 
And then they went and bought some really big computers from Sun. So Eric Schmidt, kind of his investment worked out there. Um, and then, you know, the funniest thing happened. At that point, they were running the busiest web server in the U.S. government, and all the tech people got real proud and happy. We're running the fanciest web server in the U.S. government. We love this. And so they really embraced it. And they, they ran the service, and they've been running it ever since. They threw away our code a few years ago, but they ran it for quite a while. So. Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting takeaways, of course, is that when you put data online that people don't think uh, has a use, you, you, do, you do in fact find unexpected uses and unexpected users. I call that the dumb American theory. When I'm in Washington, they're like, oh, people aren't going to care about this. And again, my answer is show me the manual. You know, you're going to be shocked at how many people are going to want whatever it is we're talking about. I got that from Congress about congressional hearings. They're like, oh, no, this stuff's really boring. Only, only people are going to care are a few lobbyists in Washington. No need to make this stuff available. Uh, and it's like, you guys are nuts. You have no idea how important this is, not only legally, but, you know, like the agricultural hearings are like the best ag people in the world, and the folks that go to school at Purdue studying ag science are going to want to hear those people talking. And in many cases, that's the only time they talk in public. So it's an educational thing as well as a democracy thing. Over here. Uh, Jessica, you mentioned like the sort of like the value or the, the cost of, of doing this. And honestly, when, you know, they have. Uh, no one on here making less than three hundred thousand dollars a year on the standard side, and then, you know, an individual county in California spending, would you say, thirty thousand dollars a year? Just for Sonoma County, which just is not a Sonoma, big county. Just to buy code, just to buy code updates. Um, like, have you have you done any studies of, of you know what that is in aggregate? Like, what county governments and city governments are spending on that? No, it'd be an interesting uh, study. I don't have um, so they are nonprofits, but you know you can only break it down so much. I would love for Congress to hold hearings on this topic because that's something that a member of Congress could very quickly begin asking those kinds of questions and actually get answers. You know, um, what, one of the things that I find interesting about this initiative is if we start asking the questions about how much, uh, in the way of third-party standards are incorporated by reference. We might ask ourselves, do we really need that much law? <laughs> you know, do we, do we really need that? You know, because you know, I think this goes back to your comment earlier about how mind-numbingly uh, you know, unreadable this is. And you know, coming around to this notion of, of writing laws that people can actually understand, it would actually, you know, one of the really nice outcomes would be for us to kind of go rethink some of this and say, oh, actually, yeah, let's you know, you know, if this whole uh, ecosystem of people who are making money by, you know, writing standards which can then get stuck into laws, and that's why people have to have them. I mean, nobody's buying these things just because, oh, wow, what a great read. They're <laughs> buying them because it has the force of law, and somebody's required to know it. And, so, and there's a lot of old stuff on the books. You know, the 1969 standard for safety and welding is still has the force of law. Maybe we could take that off the books and, and update it. Um, and so really, this isn't a question. If, if you think there's too much regulation, this is totally bipartisan. If you're right wing, I hate government, government should be smaller, well, let's make this stuff available so we can look at them one by one and figure out what to ax. If you're totally left wing, right, if you think, gee, there needs to be a lot more government, we need to get these corporations under control, we need more standards, we need more effective standards, you still need them available or you can't have that dialogue. So we don't have an informed citizenry now unless you have an American Express card and happen to have a business reason for wanting to read this information. Which brings me to that Alec Ross quote. The primary struggle is no longer between left and right, but between open and closed. And I just, I love the way that you use open as a tool, and then your other tools are like duct tape and, <laughs> and boldness. And, and I, bunting. I, and bunting, <laughs> exactly. You can never have and, too much bunting. And I think you have so much in common with, uh, with our teams here because of that. Well, thanks so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, thanks. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you.